joining us with Mid-American Gardener. We're so glad to be here. I have some great guests and it's gonna be a good time of learning, maybe entertaining, educating. So we're thankful that you have joined us. I'm Diane Nolan and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois. So my areas would be cut flowers, perennials. Um, I'm in the crop science department so I can handle a few other things, but I have three talented folks with me and so I'm going to introduce them and they'll tell a little bit about their expertise and we might do some show and tells and emails. So Rusty Malding, I'm gonna start first with you. Sure, thank you, Diane. So my name is Rusty Malding, uh, along with my wife, Corey. We own a, um, a landscape company in, uh, in Watsika. Uh, I also happen to be the immediate past president of the Illinois Landscape Contractors Association. Um, so a kind of generalist, uh, good landscape, all around knowledge. Uh, and today I'd like to talk to you a little bit about leaves. You know, those things that are falling in mass quantities outside everywhere and you go out and you move them around and you get rid of them and then you turn around and there's another, you know, bushel basket full. So um, we tend to, as gardeners, make life a little complicated and I want to try to help make your life a little <laughs> easier. So uh, one of the pictures I have here is, is an example of, of what that might be. Um, so on Tuesday, when in the rain, I went out and I took a picture. So these are, these are some wet leaves, but instead of raking them, raking them and bagging them and raking them some more and bagging them some more, um, we mow them up. Uh, this is kind of a, a unique uh, change for some folks, but essentially what you're seeing here is two passes made in wet leaves. Uh, then what it does is it chops them up into really, really small pieces. And as long as that turf can poke through that, that leaf debris, um, that, that's a good thing. You le you're leaving organic matter in the soil, you're leaving um, the carbon right where it's at instead of burning it or, or hauling it off to a landfill. Um, this was two passes with this particular mulching mower. Um, and you know, if you make another third pass or it's dry, uh, it does a very, very good job of chopping them up into small enough pieces to where you typically don't see them. Um, if you have too many, and on this next picture, uh, you'll kind of see what happens whenever you have, you know, you, have, you live in a forest. Um, this is an example of little itty bitty chopped up leaves over probably uh, about 1,000, 1,500 square feet that have been chopped up and blown in as mulch on the landscape bed. There's about uh, two inches of, of leaf debris there that will compost and, and act as a very effective mulch for retaining moisture, uh, holding down weeds next, for the whole next season. Um, it also saves you a few dollars at the, uh, at the uh, local garden center for remulching. Um, so if you're wondering how we do that, um, on that mower you first saw, it had an enclosed deck, so there was no side discharge, and it uses a blade like this. Um, it's kind of wavy, and this is the initial chopping edge, and it lifts it, and then this chops it again, and it kind of keeps it in these chambers and chops and chops and chops until it drops out. Um, on the commercial mowers, you can get uh, blades like this. Some of your smaller mowers, um, they may have a different type of mulching blade that's specific to that particular model, but um, a mulching blade or mulching kit will, will do that same thing. Now, if you have a side discharge, no bagger, you may be interested in a blade like this. So again, you have your cutting edge down at the bottom, and then there are these fins, these serrated fins that will chop the, the leaf material. It generally takes a few more passes with this because it's instead of holding it in the chamber, it's actually discharging it out the side. That's still part of it. Um, but you know, two or three passes with the mower, maybe even four passes with the mower, seems a whole lot faster than running around with a, a, a leaf rake and uh, you know, ruining or, or completely not ruining, but uh, ex extending your Saturday and Sunday longer than you <laughs> might want it to be extended. <laughs> That was very diplomatic about <laughs> it. I live in an area that does have some wind, so mine just get rearranged. They get rearranged on a regular basis. But I direct them to compost piles, but I love that idea. It's, a, it's a great way to, to take advantage of your natural yes. gift. Gift! And we've had so much warm weather that it's been mowed along with the grass. Absolutely. Just naturally. One positive thing with that also, you can reduce the amount of fertilizer you're going to put down because that's going to break down. Yep. Yes. And the nitrogen goes back into the soil so you Absolutely. don't have to. So good. Thank you, Rusty, for giving <coughs> us some tips about leaves. All right, let's go next to you, Paula Blakely. I am Paula Blakely, and I am a horticulturist. I work at a line IFS farm town, and I have a passion for 
anything growing, I uh, really enjoy seed starting and vegetable gardening. And that leads us over here to our huge cardoon plant that we have. Um, I started this from seed about nine months ago. And um, it is what you could call an ornamental vegetable because it does, you, you can eat the stem, you would pull it apart and strip it like you would celery, and then you could saute it, or as, as you mentioned, putting it in uh, spaghetti mm -hmm. sauce. Uh, it's a great ornamental, it's got great pit color. It also has a very nice, uh, very large flower bud that gets, it blows up, it's, it's like a thistle, mm -hmm. large mm -hmm. thistle. The cardoon is in the artichoke family, and uh, I don't know. Oh, geez, rennet. Mm -hmm. Yes, the, uh, the, 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 stamens. the stamens from the flower can be used to create a vegetarian rennet. Mm -hmm. And you use the rennet for making vegetarian cheese. Interesting. So it's a beautiful plant if you put it in your in your and garden. That is just gorgeous. It looks great with our blue shirts. <laughs> yeah, oh, it does. <laughs> it? Glow, doesn't and it? it's quite a bit below the table. So is it about three? Four it's feet? a good. Uh, it's a good three foot. Yeah. It, so it spreads out. We thought it bit. looked better a little bit lower because it fills the whole space. If you put red celosia or something around oh. like that, the red and the gray or the, yeah. the silver it's really is beautiful. outstanding. I, I, I wasn't able to get the flower stalk to grow on it this year. I, I just don't think I, I think we were discussing the fact it, that it might a be biannual. It's a biannual. So, so it'll have some time to go back into a greenhouse. Yeah. And try that. But anyway, it's beautiful the way it is. Thank you, Paula, for bringing. You're that's welcome. one of our biggest vegetables we've ever had <laughs> on the set. <laughs> now, I'm going to go next to John Bodensteiner. Good evening. I'm a Vermilion County Master Gardener. Um, I, like uh, the rest, kinda, if it's green, I kind of grow it. I like perennials, vegetables. I, I specialize, I guess, in hostas and tomatoes. Um, but tonight, I brought a indoor plant or it was an outdoor plant but it's going to become an indoor plant and with the weather coming up we are going to uh, be needing to bring these indoors and before we do we need to kind of check over our, our plants that we've had outdoors ideally we would have already been bringing them closer to the house to kind of harden them off for the inside because they're going to be the environment is going to be changed dramatically for them we're going to decrease the amount of humidity we're going to decrease the amount of sunlight dramatically. And so there may be some uh, dramatic changes in some of these plants. Some of these plants have dead leaves. You may as well take those off because they could be harboring uh, disease or an insect in there. And then these, these little branches here that are basically no, no um, leaves on them at all, we may as well take those and just snip them and then if you if you want you can put them in another pot or just stick them into this and then it you know cut them off trim them and um, you'll have a, a nice plant come uh, next spring again yeah it or is don't overwater them right. that's another thing that that we do with indoor plants is we change a lot of their environment but one thing we make sure it has a drain and do you recommend a systemic or any sort of indoor sprays to put on the plant <sighs> To, for insects, just uh, insecticidal soap is the only thing I ever use. Most of those others can, you never know if you have children, uh, you know, or pets, they can eat some of the leaves sometimes. So you want to keep them away from that, but mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I will, if I find something, what I usually do is just take a garden hose, take it out of the pot, and just take the soil and, and then put new soil in it. Make sure all the insects are gone and repot it with uh, new good potting soil, not garden soil, but potting soil, and um, just hope for the best. Yeah. I mean, you have nothing to lose if you bring it in, because if you leave it out, it's going to freeze and come Friday night, I think, or the Friday. next and couple nights. I was gonna say, in most years, it was three weeks ago that we would yeah. have lost yeah. all of our yeah. plants. This has been phenomenal. Yeah, I, I'm glad you mentioned that because I have to take all of my house plants in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, Corey, prepare for borders because we're going to be invaded shortly. <laughs> <laughs> there go all the window spaces, every every well, ounce of sunlight. Some gets years up. it takes us by surprise. It's early, but this year there's really no excuse. Uh, no. <laughs> Even up in North Dakota, my sisters have been putting on. On they've had the same. They had 71 degrees today in Bismarck. Unbelievable. So, so we cannot complain. We might, but we should not yeah. complain. All right, well, I'm going to go next to our segment called, Did You Know? 
Before modern materials were developed, dried sunflower stalks were used in the manufacturing of life jackets. They provided buoyancy. We learn something new every day, so here on the set we're interested in that. Well, we don't have very many calls coming in, but we will start with our first one, and the rest of you give us a call. We're going to go to Gary's uh, question about orchids on line two. Hi, Gary. Hi, Diane. Thanks for taking my call. You are welcome. I uh, have an orchid that was given to us uh, back in June, and it bloomed beautifully all summer, just now losing its blooms and I wonder if it's done completely, we need to throw it out, or will, can we keep it and it'll bloom again, or what's the deal? Okay, good question. We got a couple people Don't here. Throw Let's it away. start yeah. with keep Paula. It, keep it, yeah. Um, if it looks like it's uh, overgrowing its pot, you could always transplant it if needed. Um, probably continue to water it when it's dry, and I would say perhaps pick up some orchid fertilizer, promote a little bit more blooming. And orchid I'm soil, because sure you don't want to just put it, in, put it in regular soil, because they are saprophytic, I think, and uh, I think that's the right word, where <laughs> yeah, they... Uh, I won't correct them. <laughs> they don't, um, they don't um, need to be in soil as such. Mm -hmm. they, they pull the soil out, out of just moisture, and the old adage about three ice cubes a week mm -hmm. is, it's, you know, there's I was going to say that, I just wasn't sure if that was... A legitimate. I do it. Statement. That's how I. It actually works, mm -hmm. yeah. depending on the kind of ice cube. But yeah. three is probably better. Than, they said two when it first came out, but three it means don't overwater. Yeah. yeah, it's and really what it means. A lot of times the orchids just need to need to rest for a period of time, nine yeah. months. Yes. I mean, it, it's a, almost like a, an annual bloom cycle, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. Mine was always in the spring. Now, with yours being a new orchid, it might be on a summer cycle. But mine always, you know, I had dendrobium ones, and they even a, a lady slipper, but it would flower mm -hmm. more in the spring and then rest. I didn't do anything, but kept it watered. And sometimes that stem where the flowers are on, they'll dry up, but every once in a while, you'll mm -hmm. see one towards the bottom, put up a little shoot, and you'll get another shoot off of that, and you'll get another whole set of, of blossoms. So, so it's um, possible. It's, I've, I've, I've had some now five, six years that are mm -hmm. continual every year. And it, it may be four, five, six months between blossoms, but I mean, it's... Enjoy you know, the texture yeah. of the leaf and yeah. it's a little bit of green. So, so don't throw it away. As Paula said, don't throw it away. Okay, thank you, Gary, for your question. Let's go to Carol's question. And she's on line three with a question about lilies. Hi, Carol. Hi, dear. I thank you for taking my call. You're welcome. I'm a rookie gardener. I have a type of lily. Also, I have uh, cannas, and this is my first time uh, taking the bulbs out of ground. Number one, I want to know if it's too late because it's going to be probably below freezing. And uh, exactly how do I do it? I'd appreciate your help. Okay, so cannas. All right. It's not too late mm -mm. because the ground isn't froze. You know, even if the tops do freeze, if you don't get them up before uh, it freezes, as long as the ground is okay, you're still okay. I dig them up on a, try to do it on a nice sunny day. Um, brush off as much soil as you can. Put them in on, a, on an area where the sun is, is, is shining and then go back an hour, two hours, and they'll be dried off a little bit take off as much soil again. And then I like peat moss, uh, a little damp peat moss. Sawdust. Uh, or sawdust in a container of some form where you can monitor them during the winter. And uh, if they get, they start, if you look at them and they're starting to shrink, um, spritz them, don't, don't overwater them because they'll rot. Any damaged or moldy or disease looking, you don't want to put those in there. Um, you'll, you'll probably be digging up last year's new growth with this year's expansion. I usually just save the new white purplish um, roots and, and, and throw the rest away because that, that tends to be where you end up with some of the diseases and, and uh, rot, because, and, and don't let them touch each other. I usually put some of the sawdust or peat moss in between and so they don't touch, because if you get one, it'll spread through them all real quickly. And then just keep them in a cool place? C cool, dark place. Garage mm -hmm. warehouse. Sometimes uh, when you're a new gardener, you <coughs> are too 
careful and, and if you ever wash off those roots like you said keep it dry we lost all of ours one time with a novice gardener mm -hmm. from the trial garden back before it was the Hartley selection garden that mm -hmm. lost them all did she wet. mention something about lilies yes I maybe was gonna say lilies? she did oh maybe, maybe she's lilies. talking yeah. Kayla lilies yeah. they'd be treated the same way yeah, yeah. yeah. okay I'm amazed you get them to, to live. I never have any yeah. luck with callas. I don't know why. But oh, I, I, I just leave them in the pot, take my pot down. The kale lilies, I just take those to, yeah. the, to the basement, leave them in the pot. Okay. And uh, don't mm -hmm. just let them go dormant. They're good. And that's, so that's really easy. Yeah. Okay. Well, great. Thank you for your question. Carol, let's go to Tracy's next. She's got a lilac question, and she's on line five. Hi, Tracy. Tracy, line five. I'm not hearing her. Okay, well, let's try line six. Eileen, do you have a, something to tell us about leaves? Hi, yeah, my, I'm calling from Watsika. Great. So, uh, Rusty might be familiar with knowing that there's a lot of... I can't hear you, hon. Keep going. Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, okay. Uh, that there's a lot of sycamore trees down my street, mm -hmm. and those trees' leaves are as big as plates. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, is there such a thing as getting too mulch, too much mulch on top of your grass? Because I'm on my fourth time mulching, and I still <laughs> got a lot of leaves on my trees. Sure. Yeah, that's a great question, and it's something I, I didn't touch on very well earlier. But what you don't want to do is, is leave a cover of leaf litter on your grass that will block out the sun from those leaves. It's, it's, very, it's sort of like laying a piece of plywood over it then, and it, you're going to wind up with big dead p patches in your turf. Um, so if the, um, I don't know if you remember or not, but this, the second picture that we showed, uh, that, that showed all of the, the, the mulched up leaves, if you get to the extent where you're, you're piling leaves up and piling leaves up on your turf and it's covering the grass, you want to um, r remove it. You can rake it, you can blow it over and, and put it into a mulch bed. Um, use that as, as, as mulch if you can. Um, and in worst case scenario, you know, you can always talk, think about composting in an area mm -hmm. or um, you know, see if your neighbor needs it. It's a great m resource to have. Um, it's, <coughs> it's nature's gift. Uh, it just sometimes it just keeps on giving. <laughs> <laughs> and I always think about sycamore leaves. It's almost like they're ground shakes when those oh, yeah. leaves drop. They are big. They are, they are huge. But there's no reason she couldn't strip compost if she found an area, you know, when Absol you blow it over there. Absolutely. Yeah. And sometimes you do wind up with a pile of, you know, two, three inches if you have a really heavy uh, forested area or, or wooded area. Um, and it, it can happen. So, yeah, you don't want to you don't want to leave a cover over the over the turf yeah. so that was a good question don't overdo it okay well now we're going to try line five again this time it's penny and she has a rhubarb question hi penny oh uh, thanks for taking my call you're welcome i have beautiful rhubarb well they say i've heard it ever since i was a child that if your rhubarb gets frosted on it turns poison and you shouldn't eat it is that true? It doesn't turn to poison, but there is there are crystals that you know that's why you're not supposed to eat the leaves, and there's crystals in there that will go down. Once it freezes, the the, the the those crystals move down into the stalks, and it can be very irritating to the to your throat, to your tongue, and to your stomach. So uh, unless you see damage to the leaves. Usually it's it, they're okay, but if you see any damage to the leaf, I, I would pull that stock out and, and discard it. Harvest tomorrow. Yeah, harvest. <laughs> yeah, harvest mm -hmm. before it freezes. So that's a spring frost and a, a fall, fall frost. frost. Yeah. But no, that you've heard it as since a young child because people pass that along because if it's happened to anyone, then they really want to tell others. Mm -hmm. And that's why sometimes Very. you don't want rhubarb in your pasture because. Cattle don't know that they're not supposed to eat the leaves, and they only eat the, they don't eat just the stalks, and they'll get a sore tongue and, and a sore mouth, and then can't eat anymore, and then they're, they become sick. But um, it all the all that acid crystals um, is in the um, in the leaves. Okay, so that was a good question to figure out about that. So let's do one more question before a few show and tells, and let's go to line two with Mary, and she has a question about soil. Hi, Mary. Line two. Mary, are you there? 
Okay, well, we'll try to get a hold of Mary when we come back, but let's go over to you, Rusty. What would you like to tell us about? Well, we have a, um, somebody who wrote in about moving a maple, Dennis. Uh, he has a Japanese uh, cut leaf maple, and uh, he'd like to move it and wants to know what the best time of year is. Uh, you know, it's, it's sort of funny. You, we're talking about all these leaves that are, are falling on the ground and uh, sort of thinking, well, we'll get these suckers raked up and then we're done for the year, right? Well, there's still a lot of things you can do in the dormant season and, and moving Japanese maples along with many other shrubs and trees is, is a great thing to do in the dormant season. Um, it be, be, I guess the first question I would have for you though is where are you moving it to? Um, Japanese maples tend to be very um, particular, I guess, about their siding. Um, they like an eastern exposure. They don't like the afternoon sun because it's a very finely dissected leaf. They'll burn in full sun in the afternoon heat. Um, so eastern exposure is best if you can. Um, also, they don't like it wet. So if, you, if, they, if you're in a wet area, there's a downspout nearby, if it's in a little bit of a swale or a dip, um, try to either correct that or, or amend the soil or whatever you need to do. But um, they do not like it wet. They prefer it just a little bit on the dry side, but not, not like a, you know, desert. Um, so if I had my preference, I'd probably move it in March before the leaves start to come out. Um, you stand less, a little bit less chance of having a little bit of winter burn on those stems during that period of time. You can certainly do it in December. You just may have a little bit of, of um, uh, some dieback on the tips. Don't worry about it in the spring. Wait to see what leaves out. Um, it used to be recommended to cut, uh, cut some of the branches off, you know, remove like a quarter of them. I think that's uh, pretty much been debunked. Um, and for the most part, you don't need to trim off any ex excess material on the top. You're already pruning the, the, uh, the roots and you're going to need those leaves on top to produce the carbohydrates to produce more roots later on. So um, wait and see how it goes. Let the plant tell you what needs to happen. Okay. Well said. Thank you. And now, Paula. Okay, so I have a viewer that wrote in. This spring, this little plant started to grow all by itself in an area along the walkway to our front door. Typically, we can never get plants to take hold in this area, but this pretty lady seemed to love it. Can anyone identify it? It is now about 10 inches high, and the purple flowers have a very faint, sweet scent to it. And this lady's from Normal, Illinois. By the way, I love the birch logs I in the too. landscape. It's nice. beautiful. Um, what you are growing is something called Lunaria annua. And Lunaria is a biennial, which means that it's going to grow its leaves in the first year. And then the second year, it'll come back and it will flower and then it will go to seed. And this is a picture of the seed pods that it produces at the end of its growing season. And they are also at the, the, the plant is also referred to as the silver dollar plant or the money plant. So it's just, it's, it's a great plant for mm -hmm. say a cottage mm -hmm. garden or mm -hmm. a wild area. It's, it's not something you want in a formal garden at all. It can get a little weedy looking. But it's, it's very a nice pretty. plant. Very it's nice. great ornamental for land or for uh, making flower arrangements. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Paula. And now John. What I brought for my show and tell was a couple of of plants that I bought. There's a lot of good sales out there right now. And um, <clears throat> um, I have, I've had questions uh, from callers uh, asking about uh, should I, do I need to plant these or can I store them until spring? The best answer is it's best if you can put them in the soil so that they'll survive better. But if you can't, even if you're, it, it's better to put them in the soil even if it's not going to be in its permanent place. You know, if you have a garden area that you're, you've tilled and is just waiting for spring, take these and just put them into the soil until spring and then move them to their permanent place. The other thing you can do is put them in a shady spot that, that, that's protected. You don't want a windy area. And what I do is I, I put them all as close as I can. And then once it gets really cold, if it freezes and it's going to get really cold, I take the, the, the leaf mulch that you, you're mulching and I pile that on top. Not so much as insulation, in a way it is insulation, but we get the warm days and then cold days, warm days, cold days, and that's the worst thing. So the leaves on top kind of insulate it to keep it all about the same temperature throughout the winter. And then, and then uh, come spring, I take them, you know, if it starts to get warm, take the leaf 
leaves off and uh, plant them. So. Wow, and this is a nice combination, these two together. That yeah. looks really good. Yeah, the, the good. Ioannimus and, uh, and a hookera. Very nice. My, the show goes so fast. Really appreciate all of the good calls. We have great viewers and I appreciate you. Thank you three for your expertise and knowledge and telling us how to grow things and mulch things, whatever the case may be. I wanna thank each of you for watching. There's a lot to be done this fall, so get out there and get gardening and we'll see you next time. Goodbye. <music>